Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to part three of Ashley Ireland's COVID-19 mini-series. Uh, my name is Daniel Coakley, and I'll be chairing today's session. Okay. So um, just briefly, this is the agenda for today's webinar. Uh, so I'll give a short introduction and cover some uh, housekeeping and general references before handing over to today's panelist, uh, Professor William Banfleth, on the topic of today's webinar, managing HVAC systems to reduce infectious disease transmission. Um, so there'll be about 10 or 15 minutes for Q&A from attendees, and I'll finish off with some, some closing announcements at the end. Um, so before we begin, uh, I just wanted to make a couple of points regarding the questions and feedback you might have during today's webinar. So all attendees are, are muted, but if you want to ask a question, please use the questions tab or the chat function to submit your query and we'll do our best to answer it during the seminar. Um, and you can submit questions at any time, so try and submit them early so that we have a chance to, to get to them during the session. Um, if you have any difficulty or you want to follow up afterwards or email contact details are provided on the slides and uh, you can follow up by email afterwards. Um, so I know all of you are keen to hear Bill's presentation, so I'm going to fly through the next couple of slides and these were already covered in a lot more detail in some of our early earlier um, webinars in this series, so you can find those on the website. And also the slides themselves are available in the handout section of GoToWebinar and they will be available on the website uh, on our webinars page shortly. Um, and lastly, when the seminar is concluded, you'll re receive a short survey, um, which we'd really appreciate you, uh, your response on. Okay, um, so the, this webinar series was launched as part of our response to COVID-19 uh, in order to help disseminate expert guidance to our members. Um, we've also got a COVID-19 reference section on our website where you can find further information as well as links to relevant guidance from ASHRAE and other professional organisations. And the recordings and slides from previous webinars are also available on the website along with a series of technical articles that we've been running uh, alongside this series. Um, so the series is run every two weeks and will run up till the 24th of September. Um, the future speakers are still being confirmed with dates to be announced uh, via our mailing list in due course once these have been uh, fixed in. Um, so this slide has a lot of information on it, um, just in summary with regard to the information and resources that ASHRAE provides. So I'd advise if you're interested to download the handouts so you can access the links provided. Um, but just to highlight some of the key resources, um, there's a section of the ashray.org website um, that has a, a free technical resources on a variety of topics. Um, the ASHRAE Epidemic Task Force, which uh, Bill chairs, will be covered in more detail uh, later on in the presentation. Um, and just to, just to say they're doing an excellent job in compiling guidance and answering queries since the, the pandemic started. Um, aside from this, there's a number of uh, ASHRAE position documents, uh, technical articles, handbooks, standards, guidelines, etc., which ASHRAE have made uh, freely available to download in response to COVID. Um, and finally, I just wanted to mention the ASHRAE Learning Institute, which provides uh, free instructor-led training courses um, and has recently been running a series of excellent seminars over the last couple of months. Um, some of which are highlighted on, on this slide. Um, there's one remaining uh, next Tuesday um, uh, from, it'll be 4 to 5 p.m. local uh, local time. And uh, the topic is on analysis of airflow patterns and flow paths of airborne contaminants with Keyshore and Carry. Um, and you can also view uh, recently archived presentations for free. Um, and I just wanted to highlight Bill's seminar on ultraviolet germicidal radiation, uh, which you can access uh, on the link on this slide. So without any further ado, I'm going to hand over to today's speaker. And I'm delighted that we have the opportunity to, to welcome Bill Banfleth, a professor of architectural engineering at Penn State University, a fellow of ASHRAE, ASME and the International Society for Indoor Air Quality and Climate, 
Um, Bill is also a past Ashbury president, 2013-14, and has authored over 170 technical papers, 14 books and chapters. And most recently, Bill took on the enormous challenge of, of chairing the Ashbury Academic Task Force, which I mentioned earlier, um, leading a team of, I believe, over 130 volunteers, producing a, a, a really comprehensive set of, of materials related to COVID-19 uh, mitigation in buildings and HVAC systems. So um, over to you, Bill. Um, I'm just going to make you a center. Just one second. Here, that should be the correct screen. Yes. Thanks, okay, Bill. very good. Yeah, thank you, uh, Daniel, and uh, good afternoon, everyone. It's it's morning for me, but not, not too early in the morning. Uh, so I've, I've been very busy for the last four months with uh, really a second job, chairing the task force for ASHRAE and being involved in other COVID-19 related activities. It, it, it uh, really has become the main thing that I think about all day. And uh, I'll try to present a few of the key ideas about response to COVID-19, specifically with respect to uh, HVAC systems. Uh, and hopefully this will uh, get you thinking about the, the fundamental ideas that underlie the, the various things that we can do to make buildings safer. So this is a, to some extent a, a general talk, but clearly we're here because of, uh, of COVID-19. Um, what this has done is to make us recognize in a way that I don't think many did before the extent to which uh, buildings are involved in infection transmission. And I think one of the enduring legacies of the, uh, the pandemic will be that we, um, change some of our standards and our design approaches so that uh, all buildings, not just healthcare facilities, are designed to be more resilient when an epidemic disease comes around. Uh, the, the goals for this talk are to uh, cover some of these COVID-19 specific issues, uh, to put HVAC systems in, in context with respect to, to how they affect infection risk, and uh, to review some of the uh, measures that we can apply to to make buildings safer. So those will be all mixed up in the the course of this presentation, and then I'll I'll give you a short overview of the ASHRAE Epidemic Task Force and and the guidance at the uh, end of it all. So the current situation with respect to the uh, the pandemic is is a very uh, challenging one. We're we're trying to control a a very serious infectious disease when uh, we don't know a lot of important things about it very accurately. We don't know yet with a great degree of accuracy the shedding rate of infectors, although it's much discussed. Um, we don't know the infectious dose of SARS-CoV-2 that causes uh, infection with high probability yet. Uh, we don't know the viral content of infectious droplets or particles accurately, uh, the spectrum of particle sizes that are produced by respiratory droplets have uh, viruses in them, but we're, we're not entirely sure which particles have the, the most and present the most risk. And uh, while there is a strong suspicion of aerosol or airborne transmission in, in some circumstances, it's not uh, definitively proved and then there's still quite a bit of debate between uh, the aerosol science and engineering community and uh, public health authorities. And at the same time, we're under tremendous pressure to get our societies and our economies back to something that uh, looks like normal life. So a very interesting challenge for all of us in, in our uh, industry. So a lot of things we, we don't know. Um, what what do we know? There, there are some things that are, are known that are relative are uh, related to managing risk, but some of these uh, facts come in, in forms that require some interpretation. 
So uh, the SARS-CoV-2 virus we know is, is very small as viruses typically are. It's only about 120 nanometers, um, tenth of a micrometer. But we also know that it's carried in larger particles and droplets. So actually the size of the virus is not the most important thing. It's the, the size of the, the particles that carry it. And in another useful thing that we know about uh, SARS-CoV-2 is that it's quite susceptible to uh, inactivation with UVC light. So that's a uh, one of our possible interventions that could be helpful. Uh, we know that the particles that contain the virus are quite filterable by uh, efficient filters that we find in all sorts of HVAC systems, not uh, necessarily HEPA filters. And also the particles are small enough that uh, many of them can be removed by ventilation. So this is all good news with respect to, uh, to managing risk. Um, and another important uh, bit of evidence is actually evidence that uh, we, we don't find, which is uh, transmission of COVID-19 in, in properly ventilated spaces where uh, other protections are being observed, separation and, uh, and masks <clears throat> and so forth. So that's that's all helpful information. Uh, we also have learned some things from super spreading events from these uh, incidents that uh, produce lots of infections from typically one pre-symptomatic or asymptomatic infected person. Uh, normally those have been associated with high occupant density, uh, a crowded transit bus, a, uh, a restaurant during a, a Chinese New Year celebration, a call center, in, in, in Korea, uh, either measured or inadequate ventilation, uh, suspected inadequate ventilation are, are found in these places. We, we know that from at least one case, the uh, Guangzhou restaurant, and we suspect it in others like the uh, Skagit Valley Washington choir practice event in, in the US. And, and also a uh, relatively long residence time of, of infectors and susceptible individuals uh, seems to be a part of this. So uh, diners in a, a restaurant who are together for an hour or more, people who are working in the same space, that all suggests that, that perhaps uh, SARS-CoV-2 uh, requires a fairly high dose to, to be infectious. And so it takes a, a period of time to acquire it. There's also uh, some possible role of air movement in, in spaces that's been suggested as a, a factor in some of these events. And um, that seems to be working to extend the range of droplet transmission. If you have strong air currents that are able to carry the, the larger droplets, larger than five micrometers outside of the, the normal one to two meter uh, high risk zone that is, is usually used to define separation uh, guidelines. And we also know now that infectious aerosols can penetrate uh, HVAC systems. So for a long time, um, I heard many saying we don't need to really be worried about increasing filtration or uh, other measures that relate to improvements to our air handling units you know, because we really don't see any virus there. Well, as of a couple of weeks ago, uh, we now have a study published where uh, Viral RNA was found everywhere from the uh, uh, return grill to the MER 15 filters to the supply grills in uh, several hospital air handling units. So there's no question that these small particles that may contain viruses can be transported. Why, why we're not seeing infections being caused by space-to-space uh, -space transport is, is a different issue. That goes back to the question of the infectivity of, of the virus. So uh, those are things that we, we don't really know very well and, and uh, some other bits of information that are helpful. What, what can we do then to, to manage risk for this particular disease or for others that uh, haven't come around yet? We don't know what the next epidemic disease will be or what its characteristics will be. They could be quite different from, from SARS-2. The things that we can do include, uh, first of all, applying uh, established and, and uh, well-demonstrated uh, effective principles of risk management. 
we can uh, apply the knowledge that we have about uh, aerosol and airborne disease transmission. Uh, we can apply uh, pr the principles for controlling exposure to contaminants that, that uh, we understand uh, that can be implemented in HVAC systems. And I guess I repeat it for emphasis, applying those principles of risk management. Uh, we need to be willing also to change our, our views of, of what is the best uh, approach as uh, emerging knowledge becomes available. We're, we're certainly in a situation with respect to COVID-19 that um, we may yet learn things that change our views about what the highest risk uh, of transmission is and how much effort we should put into controlling that. And a final thing that I think is important is to recognize that all of the guidance that's available, even the quite detailed guidance that you'll find at the, the ASHRAE Resources website, uh, is a starting point, and it still comes down to the responsibility of professionals to apply it to particular uh, situations after evaluating the, uh, the various factors that apply there. But it can be helpful. It just can't be relied on as prescriptive uh, advice that's always going to be correct. So let's go into some of the, uh, the background here to lay a foundation for controls. Uh, infectious diseases can be transmitted by a number of different modes. Uh, we're mainly concerned with the ones that relate to respiratory illnesses at, at the moment. So the, the so-called airborne route, uh, which is broken down by uh, the medical community into uh, close contact or large droplet uh, transmission that occurs over a short range, uh, assumed to be the result of, of large droplets that are too, uh, too large to travel a long distance before they settle to some surface, a floor or a table or something else. And uh, also aerosol or airborne transmission which is transmission due to uh, exposure to smaller droplets or particles that travel uh, a longer distance away from a source and can stay airborne for long periods of time, in, in some cases, more or less indefinitely for very small particles. There's also intermediate surface or fomite transfer, uh, once thought to be an important mode for COVID-19, but recent statements from the health authorities suggest that they are, are less concerned about it than they were at one point. And then other uh, modes that are, are not um, particularly important to this discussion, uh, transmission through water or food, through direct physical contact. And, and here we mean bodily fluids like uh, blood, for example, as in the case of Ebola and uh, insect or animal vectors. We don't have any evidence that COVID-19 is, is transmitted by uh, that route. So our, our HVAC systems can mainly impact uh, aerosol and, and fomite transmission, uh, but they're only part of the solution because uh, for many diseases like COVID-19, the uh, close contract uh, transmission is important and there isn't a lot we can do by uh, controlling ventilation and removing things from the air with filters, et cetera, to, uh, to change that part of risk. So where do infectious aerosols come from? Uh, we're the main sources, infected humans. Uh, almost any activity that involves inhalation and exhalation produces uh, a fairly significant uh, amount of droplets of various sizes. So breathing, talking, singing, coughing, sneezing, shouting, all of these will produce droplets. Uh, and you can see a, uh, a cough uh, visualized there on the right-hand side. You see, I think, the uh, wide range of sizes, some very heavy ones that are falling close to the, uh, the person who's coughing and others <clears throat> that uh, don't seem to be much affected by gravity at all and are moving away horizontally. We can also have aerosols uh, produced by plumbing fixtures. Uh, that's been discussed uh, quite a bit in, in the context of the pandemic. You see a, a toilet uh, after flushing there in the cloud of, of aerosol that's producing. There is some uh, suspicion of uh, fecal aerosol transmission uh, being possible, but again, that's not well documented. Uh, it is good advice these days to close the, the toilet 
seat if there is a, a lid on the toilet before flushing for that reason and, and a lot of tensions being paid to how uh, we might want to design public restrooms in the future. There are also medical pr procedures that uh, produce uh, aerosols, uh, dental procedures, intubation, which is a big concern because many COVID-19 patients need to be put on ventilators and, and that procedure has to be done and, and others as well. But, uh, this is where <clears throat> these aerosols come from and the, the viruses will be in the aerosols, not uh, shed as individual viruses. So the important thing is what uh, particle size do these droplets eventually dry to as their moisture content reduces once they've been uh, emitted into the air. All right, so uh, respiratory aerosol properties. Uh, the figure on the right here shows uh, distributions of droplet sizes, in other words, it's a log-log scale. Uh, some good work that was done back in the 1940s by uh, Dugwood in the United States that's still referenced. And you can see that while there are uh, quite a few large droplets that are larger than 10 or even 100 uh, microns, there are uh, many that are smaller. And uh, these are the initial droplet sizes. They will <clears throat> desiccate to sizes that can uh, stay airborne. And there have been studies uh, not of, of uh, SARS-CoV-2 yet to the same extent, but particularly of influenza that have showed that uh, a large fraction of the viral load emitted by a, an infected shedder uh, is in small <clears throat> droplets or particles, smaller than, than uh, five micrometers. And these are, are droplets or particles that, that can stay aloft for a fairly large period of time. And this is why um, uh, many are concerned about the possibility for uh, aerosol transmission at, at larger distances away from infectors. So these, these large droplets, uh, we expect because of their settling rates to fall fairly quickly unless they're and close to the uh, infected person, unless they're being pushed by a a high velocity air current. Uh, some of the larger droplets produced by coughing and sneezing can be ballistic and go longer distances, which is one reason for uh, wearing a mask as a, a way to protect others if you happen to be infected. Uh, the small droplets can remain airborne uh, for a long time and move large distances. There's, there's still a lot of discussion about what the dividing line is between large and small, it would be an artificial line, <clears throat> no in, matter what, but uh, uh, these range from 60 micron initial diameter to 10 micron final diameter is uh, sizes that have been suggested as being significant in the literature. <clears throat> so the public health authorities like WHO and, and uh, also national organizations like the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention in the US uh, are sticking to a position that transmission is uh, very heavily uh, on the side of, of close contact, large droplet transmission. And only within the last week or so has there been uh, even uh, much of a suggestion from those organizations that airborne or aerosol transmission is possible, but there seems to be uh, now some uh, movement in, in that position to uh, recognize that under some conditions it's possible that this longer range transmission can take place. Uh, ASHRAE, ARIVA, and, and other HVAC societies <clears throat> actually took that uh, position initially. Um, HVAC systems mainly affect aerosol transmission, so there, there really wouldn't be uh, much for us to do in terms of responding to the pandemic if it weren't possible. Uh, what ASHRAE and other organizations have done is to take the available evidence um, and interpret it in the light of something called the precautionary principle. Uh, and that's why we have been recommending aerosol and airborne protections for months, even though it's not clear to the medical community that we have definitive proof that it happens. So what is the precautionary principle? Uh, it's applied in, in different fields, but uh, a statement of it uh, that comes from a, a paper by a, a a physician 
is that one should take reasonable measures to avoid threats that are serious and plausible. So with uh, COVID-19, we have a disease that uh, has no uh, vaccine yet that uh, has caused a lot of deaths that uh, puts particular segments of the population at great risk. And we have some examples of uh, incidents that suggest that there could be aerosol transmission. So uh, the precautionary principle would say that until you can prove otherwise, you're better off taking those precautions than uh, betting that it will turn out not to be the case that there's aerosol transmission. So let's move on now to um, the idea of a, a risk management uh, process. This is something that uh, those who've worked in the indoor air quality arena or other risk management um, areas will be familiar with. Uh, we have multiple modes of transmission for infectious diseases. So we, uh, we need to think about applying multiple controls. And the standard hierarchy of controls uh, is uh, in, in decreasing order of effectiveness to, to first eliminate sources if it's possible to do that. That's hard to do when we're dealing with uh, infectious disease and uh, potentially uh, asymptomatic infected individuals who are out in the general population. The next level after that is to apply engineering controls, which can uh, reduce exposure uh, using HVAC system uh, features, uh, components, and operational measures. And, and others as well. And, and then after that, administrative controls, changing the way people behave. So distancing uh, could fall into uh, that category and some of the other things that are being done to reduce exposure. And finally, personal protective equipment. PPE, uh, while it seems like it might be a very highly effective way of, of protecting individuals, um, turns out to be one of the least effective because it depends on, on how effectively the individual uses it. Um, so what we do is, is uh, important and squarely in the middle of the, uh, the hierarchy of controls here. Uh, to come up with a good overall risk management strategy, we need to have multiple parties involved. So not just the engineers trying to do what they can to control airborne transmission by changing HVAC operation, um, but also the, the owner and, and operator of facilities and uh, professionals whose expertise is more on the side of uh, infection control from the personal point of view, industrial hygienists and infection control specialists, and we could uh, mention physicians here as well. But, uh, we're gonna focus on engineering controls here because that's what we're uh, able to do something about. Uh, so source control for, for COVID-19, we'll just mention this in passing, uh, both distancing and, and, and the wearing of, of masks, like surgical masks, uh, are the, the closest we come to source control for uh, the general population outside of a, a healthcare uh, environment. Uh, both can be quite helpful. Uh, the figure on the right here shows the impact of wearing even a simple cloth mask on uh, reducing the projection of aerosol produced by <coughs> uh, talking or, or breathing uh, a larger distance away from the, uh, the person. So if the uh, man in this image was infected and that aerosol that he's exhaling uh, contained active viruses, wearing the mask would reduce the, the amount in, in absolute terms and also would reduce the distance that it projected. Uh, and of course, uh, masks can be personal protective equipment as well if someone is wearing an N95 mask. The uh, uh, one concern about N95 masks is, as you can see from this picture on the, the upper left, uh, many of them have valves in them so that uh, while the wearer is protected when they inhale and the uh, air that they're breathing goes through the filter media. When they exhale, there's actually a relief valve <clears throat> to make it easier to exhale and they're exhaling unfiltered air. So in that case, this mask provides uh, mostly protection to the wearer and much less to someone who might be uh, exposed to their exhalation if, they, uh, if the wearer happened to be 
In fact, the, the mask below, the cloth mask, is actually better from that point of view. There have been uh, some interesting studies of the effect of uh, mask wearing on reducing the R0 factor of, of COVID-19. Uh, this is an interesting figure from uh, the paper that's uh, noted there in the, the footnote that uh, uh, looks at the, the R0 that results from uh, a certain uh, fraction of people wearing masks and uh, how effective the mask is. So uh, you don't have to have perfect adherence and you don't have to have a, a perfectly efficient mask to <clears throat> have a significant effect on the uh, risk of infection. Of course, the, the goal of all of these measures from an epidemiological point of view is to get R0 down to less than one, which means that the uh, uh, epidemic is dying out. <clears throat> so now let's move on to the engineering controls. Uh, the, the five things that we, we have at our disposal are, are ventilation, the, the use of, of air uh, to <clears throat> remove contaminants, how air is distributed to air movement in spaces, uh, filtration, uh, removing particles physically from the air, uh, disinfection, and also we should mention temperature and humidity control. These uh, things all come up in the, the various guidance that's produced by ASHRAE and other uh, HVAC societies and other organizations that are producing guidance. So ventilation and uh, pressurization are uh, part of the same concept. Uh, ventilation with outdoor air dilutes contaminants and by diluting contaminants, we increase the exposure time required for uh, acquiring uh, in the infectious <clears throat> dose. It's effective, but um, energy intensive, even if we have energy recovery. I think everyone's already familiar with how costly conditioning outside air is, but it, it does work. The, the figure on the right uh, <clears throat> is from a study of uh, incidents of, of common cold in a Chinese university that was done several years ago, and the uh, frequency of infections over uh, a year is related here to the average or the mean uh, winter ventilation rate in dormitories. <clears throat> the uh, 5.2 liter per second per person rate that is the highest that they measured is, is lower than we would typically want to see in most buildings and uh, 1.3 is, is quite low. That's getting down around the ventilation rate due to leakage that was found in the Guangzhou uh, restaurant where there was no mechanical ventilation. You can see a very clear trend there in, in of increasing infections with decreasing ventilation because we would expect that the concentration of uh, infectious aerosol inside of these buildings was increasing. <clears throat> so uh, ventilation is, is really uh, coupled with exhaust and, and uh, sometimes we think about putting outside air into a building. We can also think about removing indoor air from the building, which is doing the same thing. And, and uh, that is normally done when we're thinking about isolating uh, potentially infected individuals. And we wanna make sure that we're using um, good pressure relationships, the relative pressure relationships to make sure that we're not distributing contaminated air from a uh, more contaminated space to a less contaminated space where someone who's not infected might be exposed and, uh, and become infected. Uh, the concern about air distribution, as I, I already mentioned, uh, but I'll, I'll touch on it again, is that if we have strong air currents and, and we also have uh, <clears throat> poor ventilation, then we have a situation where uh, those air currents may carry uh, larger droplets away from an infected person and essentially extend the radius for uh, close contact infection. So a lot of the guidance that uh, has been produced that deals with uh, industrial facilities has uh, recommended not using pedestal fans, which are very common for providing convective cooling in <clears throat> environments that aren't normally mechanically cooled and also not using uh, personal fans in workplaces uh, either, which is common in, in some uh, offices as well, depending on the kind of temperature that's maintained indoors. Uh, personalized ventilation, personalized exhaust uh, can be 
uh, air distribution modes that are effective. Uh, they, they work in situations where you have uh, individuals who are going to be in one place working for a period of time. But uh, in general, we're thinking here about <coughs> the uh, larger currents produced by air conditioning equipment, for example, uh, mini split systems that, that often produce fairly strong air flows. Filtration is uh, <clears throat> quite effective at removing infectious material from the air. As long as it's airborne, um, essentially all particle sizes can be filtered with some degree of efficiency, <clears throat> but none with 100% efficiency. Uh, even HEPA filters will see some viral penetration and, and we have bypass around filters that uh, allows some contaminants to pass. But uh, filters are a very effective way of controlling risk. It doesn't have to be on a single pass. In, in uh, uh, most environments with most air contaminants that are associated with particles, we don't need to remove 100% of them every time the air goes through the filter, but we wanna have filters that have a high enough efficiency that it doesn't take many air changes to reduce the concentration to a level that um, lowers risk substantially. Um, in order to, to use filters effectively, we have to have recirculation to, to capture airborne contaminants. And you know, that's uh, been a, a point of discussion because some of the guidance that was published initially uh, said that we should try to minimize or eliminate recirculation in HVAC systems. Uh, for the types of systems that we see frequently in the U.S., maybe less frequently in other parts of the world, um, the filters are in those systems. And if we eliminate recirculation to bring in more outside air, uh, what we're doing is essentially uh, defeating the purpose of the filter because if no recirculated air goes through it, it's not actually removing any indoor contaminants. Um, and so filters work if you get enough air uh, through them, whether it's a central filter or a, a portable filter. And again, if the contaminants that we're concerned about are airborne. Um, this finding that uh, the virus actually penetrates air handling units is important because as long as there were no studies published that showed that there was viral RNA in, in air handling units, there were some uh, very bright professionals who said, well, there's no evidence um, that the particles with the viruses are even getting there. So why should we do anything to, uh, to improve uh, central air handling unit uh, filter efficiency? Uh, this slide tries to, to answer that question to an extent. Uh, the, the figure on the, the left uh, shows some uh, measurements of in, in uh, respiratory aerosol sizes from different studies. And, and again, as I showed in the figure a while ago, uh, many small droplets are produced that will dry to small particles. And the, the figure on the lower right comes from a, an early uh, study that did sampling for SARS-2 in uh, a hospital in, in Wuhan. And uh, you can see from these figures that um, viral RNA was found in uh, very small particle sizes, many uh, particles smaller than uh, 2.5 microns had uh, viral RNA copies in them. So we have to conclude from this that it's possible that uh, active virus will be in those small particles and that we uh, ought to, to think about doing something to control them. Uh, Another point I, I like to make at, at this stage of, of this discussion is to compare ventilation and filtration. Uh, in some parts of the world, I find there's a, a really high reliance on uh, ventilation, on an outside air, and less, uh, say, willingness or interest in using air cleaners. Uh, this figure, I think, is very illuminating. It comes from a, a study that was done by uh, Brett Stevens at Illinois Institute of Technology and, and one of his graduate students. And it's a, it's a, a theoretical analysis that they were looking at uh, risk of influenza 
uh, infection as a function of the filter efficiency used in, a, in the building systems and the ventilation rate. The, the Wells-Riley uh, model was used to, uh, to calculate relative risk. And what you see here is that the uh, increase of filter efficiency from MERV 4, which is below ASHRAE standard 62.1 or 62.2 standards, uh, up to 13, uh, results in a, a fairly significant increase in uh, risk reduction uh, with a, a relatively small increase in cost. This is a 500 square meter office building and we're looking at uh, 100 to $150 per year uh, as a cost associated with more efficient filters. The, the colored curves to the right are uh, curves for ventilation required to achieve uh, the same level of risk reduction. And, and you can see that it's several times more, uh, five to, uh, to perhaps eight times the uh, cost if we're trying to get down to the minimum uh, relative risk. The other thing that this figure shows us is that past MERV 13 or 14, the filters keep getting more expensive, but the reduction in risk is not highly significant. And that's uh, presumably because with uh, relatively higher change rates through rather high efficiency filters, and we're 14 is getting up to around 90% across the board, uh, going higher than that does not really increase the uh, uh, reduction of particles in the air by an amount that has a, an impact on infection risk. Uh, one of the, the reasons that we uh, feel confident in promoting some improvement in filter efficiency is that there are many other benefits to having more efficient filters in buildings than we typically put into them. So uh, this is a different study uh, done by a group of uh, researchers from Canada, and they were uh, trying to monetize the impacts of higher MER filters uh, in different locations that have different uh, ambient particulate matter profiles. So what we're seeing on the left is the net health benefit per year uh, per person in different locations uh, associated with uh, different MERV ratings from six, the, the minimum that ASHRAE specifies all the way up to 16. And uh, you can see that in going from the, the current standard minimum six to eight up to 13 or 14, there's a, a very large increase in uh, benefits per year from reduced morbidity and mortality from PM exposure. It's mostly mortality benefit, as you can see from the example curve on the right, a little bit from morbidity. And the, uh, the health benefits greatly outweigh the costs of uh, more expensive filters and perhaps some increase in energy consumption to uh, operate them. Uh, we'll say a, a word just to, uh, about one type of air disinfection. As you know, there are other types of air cleaners that have been discussed, but we'll, uh, we'll talk about uh, germicidal ultraviolet for a moment here and, and uh, not get to others like uh, photocatalytic oxidation and, and ionization, dry hydrogen peroxide, but uh, you're, you're aware that uh, they exist, I'm, I'm sure. Um, germicidal UV is the, the best uh, understood and, and best uh, demonstrated in terms of efficacy of these technologies. Uh, we use UVC light to damage uh, DNA or RNA as shown in the figure on the upper right. We break some of the bonds in the uh, uh, genetic material of the microorganism and that causes dimers to form as shown there and uh, that kind of damage present, prevents them from being able to replicate. We mainly use mercury vapor lamps that produce 254 nanometer uh, UVC, and that is close to the maximum effectiveness wavelength, uh, which is about 265. So uh, 254 is at perhaps uh, 85 to 90 percent of, of that maximum effectiveness. Uh, the dose response is exponential. Uh, we have measurements for rate constants for many microorganisms. Coronavirus susceptibility is good. We're, we're doing some tests in our own labs here on, on SARS-2 that should be published within 
a few months, and it's similar to SARS-1 and other coronaviruses, uh, more susceptible than measles or influenza. And it's been uh, used for a long time, for, for uh, 80 years or more, and the CDC in the U.S. Uh, approves it for tuberculosis control. There's some interesting emerging technologies, far uv which is safer than 254, and if it passes all the safety checks, may be uh, usable in occupied spaces, and people can be exposed to it, but it's not there yet. And uh, there are other technologies as well, but uh, we don't have time to cover those today. Just briefly mention the, the typical implementations. Uh, upper air or upper room systems, as shown in the upper left, are uh, one way of, of doing this. Put fixtures uh, typically on the wall, so they could be pendant from the ceiling that create a disinfection zone above the occupied zone, as shown on the, uh, the upper right and uh, natural air movement either from uh, human thermal plumes or equipment or from air movement caused by the HVAC system will carry air into that uh, region and it will be disinfected. And it's been demonstrated in, uh, in a number of studies that that can be equivalent to uh, 10 air changes per hour of outdoor air or more for a relatively small input of power. So this is, is potentially a, a very good way to uh, provide additional protection. I will say that it's it's fairly expensive. We're looking at three to four dollars per square foot just for the equipment in uh, in US dollars. Um, and then uh, installation has to be added. So it is fairly expensive. We can also put UV into air handling units as shown lower uh, left and there it can control biofouling on the coil. And also if the lamps have enough power, it can do uh, a high level of air disinfection uh, even with a very short exposure, although many people don't believe that until you, you show them the math, but it, uh, it, it can be done and it has been done. One more way of uh, using UV is for surface disinfection and UV robots, as you see over here on the, uh, the lower right, are uh, being used for disinfection in healthcare facilities and, and even in uh, hotels and other settings now uh, during the pandemic. Uh, getting a little short on time here, we'll try to move it along. I, I want to mention that uh, when you're looking at a, a strategy for uh, reducing risk, it's a good idea to look at the combined effects of ventilation, filtration, and air cleaning. And this can be done using a, a metric like air cleaner effectiveness that uh, looks at the incremental benefit of adding another control to a base situation. So we could say uh, minimum ventilation is our uncontrolled condition and then we add a, uh, a higher efficiency filter or add UV. Uh, what we find is that in, in some cases uh, there are synergistic effects, uh, usually they're diminishing returns, but in some cases there are uh, actually uh, trade-offs say between ventilation and filtration when we reduce recirculation. And sometimes our systems will uh, be uh, mutually, uh, will be exclusive with respect to different uh, interventions. So dedicated outdoor air systems are 100% outside air. Uh, it doesn't help to put filters into them. If you want to use filtration, you have to introduce that into the system a different way. So I did a really uh, simple calculation for a, a recirculating system that had outside air and uh, we put a filter or air cleaner into it. And I looked at two uh, scenarios, uh, one where we have a variable filter efficiency with 20% outside air, another one where uh, the filter efficiency was fixed at 60%, maybe representing something like a MERV-13 and uh, have variable outside air fraction represented by this parameter F. And so uh, if we, we do that, we get the results we see here. The um, uh, effectiveness of the, uh, the filter in the case where we have 20% outside air and increase the, uh, the filter efficiency increases as we go from uh, zero to 100% filter efficiency, essentially from no filter to uh, a near HEPA filter. And uh, the blue curve shows us that the uh, normalized concentration, the, the steady state concentration compared to the no filter 20% outside air, air case uh, drops uh, significantly. We get uh, from 100% down to about 20%. On the other hand, 
if we look at a 60% efficient filter and we start varying the air from 20% upward, we, we actually get uh, about the same, uh, actually the same reduction in, in normalized concentration. It goes down to, uh, to 20% of what it was initially, but as we increase the outside air fraction, the effectiveness of the filter drops to zero. So we have two cases here where we have uh, essentially the same outcome, but in one of them, we have to condition five times the amount of outside air. And then this you know, perhaps indicates why uh, Azemian and Stevens uh, study produced the result that it did. Uh, to touch on temperature and humidity control uh, briefly, I'm sure everyone has uh, heard about the 40 to 60% recommendation. I see Stephanie Taylor is going to be talking to you and that is uh, uh, her uh, main point of, of discussion. She's very uh, pro humidity control. And there has been evidence for a long time that there actually is a good range for humidity. The uh, uh, Arundel and Sterling uh, curve that you see on the right or this plot has been in the ASHRAE handbook since the, the 1980s. And uh, this issue has been brought to the fore again by some recent studies that Dr. Taylor was involved in in clinical settings that showed reductions in uh, infection incidents there uh, as a result of humidity. Uh, those were in a clinical setting where there was probably reasonably good temperature control and good ventilation. Uh, so the conclusion that it was the only factor that was significant, uh, I think has to be put in the context that uh, if you had a space that had poor ventilation um, or had no filtration, uh, we might find significance from changing the filter efficiency or the ventilation rate as well. Uh, but that doesn't change the fact that uh, we do see an impact on uh, droplet uh, evaporation and uh, settling time and on susceptibility of individuals and on uh, infectivity and survival time of, of viruses. Those are all documented. So there's some reason to, to look at doing this. But with humidity and especially in uh, existing buildings, we have to be very careful. Um, there are a number of reasons actually to exercise some caution here. First of all, different pathogens respond differently to temperature and humidity. So uh, not all may be as easy to control by staying in that range. Uh, there's certainly a real risk of moisture damage and mold growth in some climates. There's a lot of concern about that in cold climates in uh, <clears throat> North America. Um, High humidity reduces UVGI effectiveness to some extent, although not enough to worry about from my point of view, uh, and comfort is also a factor. So um, ASHRAE has not made a, <clears throat> a specific recommendation to stay in this 40 to 60 range, but it is recommending that uh, it be considered. Riva, interestingly, came out quite strongly against uh, doing anything to existing humidification uh, and temperature set points uh, made the statement you see there in the, the bottom bullet. And that was based on their literature review, which you can read in the REVA guidance, and also some considerations about European climate. They are, are clear that their recommendations are for Europe. So I want to say a few uh, words in closing here about ASHRAE guidance and the task force. Uh, as was noted in the introduction, the task force is uh, a big group that's been ver working very hard uh, was formed in, in March of, of this year and we have three goals. Uh, provide short-term guidance, which we've done. Uh, provide uh, refined guidance and, and guidance on opening uh, buildings that have been shut down for the second wave. We're in the middle of that now. Uh, but we also have a, a task to collect the lessons learned and develop research agendas, recommendations for changes to standards and guidance. Um, and uh, a, a focus on resilience in uh, those documents that isn't there now. Uh, there, there are currently 26 members of the, the task force, including some ASHRAE staff directors, that the total number of people involved has now grown to about 150. Uh, the task force itself functions as a coordinating body, and we bring in TC members and standards committee members and actually members from other organizations outside of ASHRAE, uh, whoever is needed to do the, the work. Uh, these are the current teams on the ETF. I won't uh, read through all of them, but we have some that are uh, managerial 
organizational on the, the left. We have a number of uh, general um, teams that are listed in the middle. Uh, we've just added the science applications and research teams at the beginning of this society year to, uh, to help uh, in the one case, refine guidance and the other uh, develop an agenda to fill gaps that we're identifying. Uh, the building readiness team is an important one. I'll talk about their guidance a little bit. We also have a number of teams that are focused on specific types of, of occupancy, as you can see there on the uh, right. We haven't covered all of them that uh, we might want to have guidance for yet, and we may add more teams in the future to do that, but we've, we've hit most of the main ones so far, I think. So the, the resources page was mentioned. I hope everyone will look there. You'll see that there's an email address where you can send questions. We've answered uh, hundreds and hundreds of uh, questions since that uh, address went up. There's uh, a roster where you can see everyone on the task force, a link to an FAQ and glossary of terms. The detailed guidance is at these tabs at the, uh, the bottom. And uh, instead of uh, putting together uh, glossy, highly produced documents. We try to get things out uh, rapidly, and we've done that in the form of uh, PowerPoint uh, presentations that are uh, on the, the website as PDFs that you can download. So if we go to the Building Readiness tab, for instance, we'll see uh, a link there to the PDF. And also, all of that guidance can be uh, accessed uh, as, as HTML in the web page too, but uh, if you want to keep a copy, you can download it from that link. Uh, this is what the top page of the Building Readiness Guidance <clears throat> looks like. Uh, this is the, the May 21st guidance. Uh, this will be updated soon. The, the teams uh, post new guidance as soon as it's available. And I think you get an idea just from looking at this top page how detailed uh, the guidance is. There are, are many uh, sections here that are specific to uh, various aspects of getting a building ready to occupy. And uh, if you look through it, you'll, you'll find quite detailed information on, on some of those topics. Uh, but it begins with, uh, I think, some very important discussion about the need for evaluating buildings if we're going to reoccupy them. Uh, we all know that many buildings suffer from uh, deferred maintenance, to use a polite term for it and, and aren't operating as they should. I think one of the things that we're emphasizing very strongly is that the first thing we should do to make buildings safer in the pandemic is to make sure that they're operating properly. So if you look at this section of guidance, it will walk you through the things that should be done to get the building ready and then how to operate it once uh, people are actually coming back into it, whether it's an office building or a school or a, a store. So some of the things that are covered in the systems evaluation are, are gathering documentation, inspecting equipment systems and controls, uh, making recommendations for mitigation strategies. Uh, for the, the controls evaluations recommended that you follow ASHRAE guideline 11. And after doing the evaluations, then uh, the, the final step should be to prepare uh, deficiency logs and work orders to repair things and to prepare reports on mitigation strategies that uh, are recommended for implementation. Uh, I'll just show again in uh, uh, this list of things that are covered under the detailed guidance uh, that have, have uh, been important questions that have been asked, like what do we do with uh, energy recovery ventilate, ventilation systems? Do we turn off energy recovery wheels? <clears throat> Initially, a lot of the guidance was turn them off we now have a very detailed section on how to determine whether it's safe to operate an energy recovery wheel and uh, how to make it safe to operate if it isn't. Uh, another item is filter upgrades. Uh, how do I determine what the maximum filter efficiency is I can put in my system if it's going to result in an increase in pressure drop? That's covered as well. And um, also a limitation on increasing ventilation uh, which many systems can't handle uh, up to the point where temperature and humidity control can still be maintained. So there, there's a lot there to uh, uh, review if you're doing that kind of work today. So to, uh, to summarize here, um, HVAC systems can be an important part of uh, a risk reduction strategy 
where there is aerosol or airborne uh, disease transmission, uh, all of our engineering controls are targeting reduced airborne concentrations because that will reduce exposure uh, and increase exposure time to uh, acquire an infection. Uh, we don't have a very good quantitative picture of COVID-19, but we, we do know things that are effective and uh, prudent to implement based on the precautionary principle. And uh, in terms of deciding how far we can go, I in indicated without uh, explicitly stating it, was that uh, uh, some of the recommendations are limiting out at uh, filter efficiencies and ventilation rates that are also going to be uh, very beneficial IAQ benefits if they're, they're left in place. So rather than going uh, completely to the extremes of ventilation and infiltration, I think we can consider uh, long-term benefits as well as the, the short-term uh, emergency measures. We have a pretty small repertoire of controls um, and we need to adapt them to the building for them to be effective. Uh, we, we know how to do that. There's plenty of guidance from ASHRAE and others to do that. And I, I hope you'll uh, take a look at that when you're upgrading your buildings or your, your clients' buildings. I think at that point I am done. I'm sorry I've run a little long, but uh, I did get through it all and I'll be happy to uh, take questions now and, and have some discussion. Okay, uh, thanks very much, Phil. Um, yeah, as you said, we're, we're running a, a little over time, so I, I, there's a couple of questions coming in. One was in regards to guidance for clean rooms and using air recirculation through AHUs which has been done traditionally, um, is it best to avoid this? Well, I mean, that's a very interesting question. Uh, there, there have been some who have, uh, from the outset, said that um, they thought it was uh, a bad thing to recirculate. But if you look at uh, a standard like ASHRAE standard uh, 170 for healthcare facilities, the, the whole concept of infection control there is high recirculation rates through efficient filters. So uh, if you're in a facility that has HEPA filters in it and you're doing uh, air changes uh, through through those filters, that should be uh, quite effective. So I'm, I'm on the side that says uh, recirculation is not necessarily a bad thing as long as we've evaluated the, uh, the, the effect of the filtration that we have installed in the systems that are doing it. The, the problem with recirculation in some systems is that it's not possible to uh, fit those systems with uh, very high efficiency filters. Um, so just briefly, um, I just had a couple of quick uh, closing announcements before we, we finish up. Um, so yesterday we had our uh, ASHRAE Ireland AGM and I'm delighted to welcome our new Board of Governors, uh, which are shown here. Um, so we have Michael Garrity as incoming president, uh, Kim Goodman as uh, VP, uh, Brendan O'Malley as treasurer, and I'll be staying on myself as secretary for the next year. Um, and we also have a number of new subcommittee chairs. Um, so I'd like to welcome new members, Connor Dean as YEA chair and Adam O'Donovan returning from his PhD as uh, student activities chair. Um, and just to express my thanks to our outgoing uh, board and committee members for all their efforts over the last year, especially Michael Dawkins, outgoing president and Pat McEnroy, uh, outgoing treasurer. Um, just to mention as well, we also announced our student awards at yesterday's AGM and uh, a number of, uh, I believe a couple of the students are on, on the, today's call. So congratulations to Connor Dean, NUIG, Duncan Matthews, uh, UCD and Michal Cantlin Murphy, uh, CIT for their excellent uh, project contributions. So each of them will receive a three year graduate membership as part of the ASHRAE Smart Start program. Um, our next event is, uh, as Bill mentioned, is the uh, we have Stephanie Taylor, Dr. Stephanie Taylor, uh, speaking on the 30th of July, um, and details of that event will be circulated over the coming days. Um, lastly, just to, to mention, uh, if you want to keep updated with, with this uh, webinar series and any other events, uh, please just make sure that you're subscribed to our mailing list and that you're, you're receiving our emails. Um, and lastly, just a final word of thanks to our sponsors and supporters who make our ongoing activities possible. And again, thanks to, to Professor Banford for 
your your time today and uh, for an excellent presentation. There's been a, a few comments coming through to say how, how um, uh, the uh, welcome and uh, well received the, the presentation was. So I'll, I'll pass on um, any of the, the comments afterwards and apologies again for the, the technical difficulties there at the end. Uh, my, my pleasure to be with you and uh, uh, hope everyone got something useful out of it. Thank you very much. And um, yeah, hopefully we can we can welcome you to, to Ireland when, uh, when when things come back to normal. I, I look forward to it. I will be there in a minute if you invite me. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks very much, Bill. Yeah, bye bye. Okay. All the best. Thanks, everyone. Uh, we'll close the presentation here.